So today we're talking about prairie hardy fruit breeding. While Saskatoons and raspberries have been in an abundant supply in the prairies for generations, newer species and varieties are making their way into commercial production and introducing a new generation to prairie hardy fruit. But what's coming down the pipe? Our speaker today will introduce us to some of those as well as some other some of his other work. Dr. Bob Bors is an assistant professor in the plant sciences department at the U of S. At, sorry, at the University of Saskatchewan, I should not abbreviate that. He teaches fruit science, plant propagation, greenhouse management, plant biotechnology, intro horticulture courses, and is in charge of the northernmost fruit breeding program in Canada. Recent releases include four apples, five cherries, seven half caps, and ten under the sea coleus varieties. Current a few dozen of his fruit articles can be read at fruit www.fruit.usap.ca. Current research priorities in his breeding program involve maintaining a prairie gene bank and breeding half-cap grapes and apples. A dozen other fruit crops are bred on a smaller scale. Bob won a campus-wide award for outreach at the University of Saskatchewan in 2009 and gives about 20 invited lectures for various groups in North America. Bob has cooperative projects in Russia, Norway, Mongolia, USA, and most provinces in Canada. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bob. Okay. So this gets going here. So when I was asked to speak about this, um, I was particularly asked to emphasize cherries and hascap. So I'm going to spend more time on those. But towards the end of the lecture, I will talk about what's happening with some other fruits. Uh, this slide kind of shows what we do and how much effort we put in percentage-wise. Like we're doing a lot of hascap stuff, but we're doing uh, have done a lot of cherries, hazelnuts, and apples, and uh, other fruits that we're working on. We try to maintain this this large collection of fruit as the northernmost uh, reservoir of fruit varieties. Uh, since I got my job in 1999, more than half of the fruit breeding programs around the country have, have disappeared. And a lot of those that are, are left are actually, they've been combined and one or two people run them that used to have four scientists. So we're the only ones in zone three. We used to be considered zone two, but uh, we're the only breeding program in zone three. Most of the other ones are in zone five in Canada. Uh, we have about 50 acres of fruit on campus. Uh, and you can see from the map, uh, we have most, a lot in Hascap, and probably cherries and apples are the next most common of the crops that we work on. Our funding mostly comes from royalties. When you buy a, one of our fruit varieties, 65% goes to the program, not to me personally, and 35% goes to the department who puts in an equipment fund. So most of that actually comes back to the program. And uh, we also get have had a lot of money from Sask Ag, uh, ADF Agriculture Development Fund. They really got us going. But we also have plant sales, so books and volunteers, and our students have won scholarships. We maintain a tissue culture lab to propagate our new varieties. Uh, we have uh, part of this greenhouse is used for uh, research and propagation of new things. Uh, I, a lot of the stuff I get credit for are actually done by predecessors, like the cherries started 60 years ago before I was here, but the fruit program's actually been around since 1921, and various people have uh, contributed through the line about that. We've also had major contributors like Les Curd donated his cherries and hazelnut breeding programs to us. Richard St. Pierre had a, the large native fruit program. And Karen Tonino rescued the, the program when it was in limbo between professors. I'll be talking about HASCAP, but a lot of our, our uh, HASCAP projects have been because we've made friends with others and they've sent me varieties. And uh, we really have one of the world's largest HASCAP collections, mainly because maybe we're the most friendly program. I don't know. But many people have sent us stuff. Uh, we have three technicians. We had three graduate students. Two have graduated recently this year. 
we also have volunteers and uh, students and master gardens, even farmers that have helped us out. And we do have events every year. We always have a Hascap Day. We always have fruit grower tours. Sometimes we have the Bruno Cherry Festival. Sometimes we do grafting. Our program I, has had evolving goals, and I've put the different contributors here on a list. Uh, the first guy just tried to get something to live in Saskatchewan. Uh, Nelson got into making things hardy and productive. Les Kerr for Ag Canada was hiding his breeding program from his government superiors and was breeding cherries and hazelnuts on the sly. Stushnoff was really into flavor. Once things got hardy, he was uh, starting to work on flavor. Uh, Sawatsky continued that. Richard St. Pierre uh, focused on wild fruits and Saskatoons. And by the time I got here, it seemed to me like a lot of things could be commercialized and things could be developed uh, for commercialization. We, when I first got here in 99, I knew I wanted to do mechanical harvesting for the prairies and emphasize that in breeding, but we couldn't afford a harvester yet. So we did things like, uh, well, we had umbrellas. We used to shake bushes into umbrellas and then when the bushes got bigger, we did little kids swimming pools and we made this tarp for cherries, that last one there. Uh, all of those were to mimic machines. But finally, we got a machine in 2010. So we're actually able to judge uh, some of the plants for how well they hold up to machinery. Oh, already did that slide, did that. Uh, getting into the cherries, Les Kerr had created half Mongolian cherries, which it takes them maybe six years to get as big as this. They will get larger than that, but they have little tiny fruits that are kind of sour. Uh, pure sour cherries like the Evans generally don't do too well in Saskatchewan, unless they're in someone's backyard, but most sour cherries will not grow in the prairies. And uh, by hybridizing the pure sour cherries with these half Mongolian, half sour cherries, we came up with our U University of Saskatchewan hybrids, which were uh, just about, they're all grown to s kind of scale there. Uh, they're six to eight feet tall. A full-size sour cherry uh, can be three or four times taller than a person. And this is an orchard, uh, probably a picture I took in BC. They're, they're really difficult to uh, harvest with any, well, you have specialized machinery for that. This is one of uh, our first producers in southern Saskatchewan. And those are four-year-old cherry hedges of Carmen Jewel. Now, uh, this guy has great soil, and he's also an irrigation expert. He, he's installed irrigation systems. So those plants look that nice after four years because he really knows what he's doing. But uh, that's how long ideal conditions, how, how long it takes them to get there. Traditional mechanical harvesting of those big trees is to get something like this that clamps onto the trunk and shakes the whole tree. And that actually damages the tree after about a decade or less. And that pulls it, but then you have like a tarp system. And the fruit is like dropping, can be dropping three, four, five meters into this tarp and getting damaged. And that machine, I'm told people buy them for $200,000 used. I don't know how much a new one is. Whereas sour cherries are small enough, you, if you didn't have machinery, you could make a tarp thing like this. Uh, we kind of invented this one. Well, we invented this one. Uh, it only takes like three minutes to empty a bush of cherries with that. It used to take our summer students uh, two hours or so to pick all the cherries off one bush. And there's a sideways harvester just taking the cherries off. Uh, it's really fast that way. One of the things, though, that these a lot of these harvesting machines 
are built for uh, picking a berry crop like blueberries or Saskatoons, you have to be able to crawl really slowly uh, with your tractor, go real slow speed when you go to cherries because they're so high of a yield. Here's our first uh, varieties of cherries, which I'm going to go into detail. Uh, Carmen Jewel was the first, and then the Romance series are the other ones. And I'm going to talk about them in detail. Uh, one of the things we noticed uh, was a problem with our cherries was we had used gourmet cherries from Northern Europe, which all were dark when they ripened. And a lot of our early growers were picking fruit when they were bright red. These charts show on, and these are available online on our website, the optimum color range when fully ripe for each variety. And Valentine is the only one that's really kind of red. The other ones are kind of burgundy, but Carmen Jewel's practically black. Now, I've, I made this little star system just for my presentation to say the relative opinion of myself about it. Some commercial growers might disagree with my assessment, but red is good in this uh, assessment. So Juliet, I would, I would give four stars to. It's very hearty, good flavor, tart enough for pies, good size, productive. It's first to go dormant in the fall, uh, good mechanical harvest. The only downside is it is one of the first bloomers in spring by a couple days. So theoretically, you might get a frost on that one. Uh, before the other ones. Romeo always comes out as the best flavor. Uh, and I would say this is best flavor if you're a gourmet. Uh, and it was late blooming last year. It tends to be come into production a year earlier than other varieties. Uh, it's good for mechanical harvesting and overproducer. But one year when when our variety trial was just getting started, we had a minus 50 winter, and Romeo had severe damage. I don't know if that was because it's a little less hardy, or if it was because it happened to be the only variety in the trial in good production already. Like, it, it could have been the stress of production, and then minus 50 came. But it hasn't had winter kill since then, but it's been recovering. Uh, I think that was year nine, 2009 or something. Carmen Jewel, I would give a little bit less of a start. It is dependable, dark cherry, early to ripen, good flavor, productive. Uh, it is the smallest size fruit. I could put a positive there. It also has the smallest pits. So you probably get more cherries per pound once you take the pits out. I had slight winter damage for us. It usually is the lowest sugar content of the cherries, and we're finding it's brown rot susceptible. Brown rot is a disease that's appeared in the last few years, maybe the last four years, and it, ba it usually happens if you have a lot of water and heat during the growing season, or especially the ripening season. Uh, it's only been a slight problem for us once out of five years, but some people have had it been a problem uh, for a couple years in a row. Valentine um, is also one of the more hardy ones. It's sweeter than previous evals. It's the only one that's kind of red, uh, which is a great color if you're doing dried fruit. The other cherries would be kind of black if you dried them. And I think this one looks better, you know, to have that reddish tint to it. Uh, you have a larger yield from this variety because it has larger bushes. And because it has larger bushes, you probably have to uh, prune them more often to, to make them fit your harvesting machine. Uh, its bloom time is average. Uh, it's the only bright red cherry. Because the bushes are too vig a little on the vigorous size, it's more prone to mechanical harvester damage if you're not pruning it as much. Cupid is one of the darkest cherries. It blooms almost a week after the other one, so it's substantially uh, 
good. It has good flavor, hearty, but I don't feel it's been very productive for us. It seems to take an extra year, whereas like uh, Romeo might start producing pretty nicely in the third year. The other cherries start producing nicely in the fourth. Cupid might take a, uh, be the fifth year till it starts coming into production. The other thing that's a bad thing with it, depending on how you look at it, um, its fruit often can be, many of them can be too large to fit the holes in the pitting machine. So if you were hand pitting or hand picking, maybe that's an advantage if you're doing something with a larger cherry. But I think you really want to have a cherry that you can massively pit. So that's why I give it a little bit less of a stars uh, than the other varieties. Crimson Passion has really good flavor and is firm, but it also had major winter damage in minus 50, but it wasn't even production yet. And it's really slow vigor and slow to root. The bushes are much smaller. It's never really come back after that minus 50 very well. So I wouldn't really recommend this for a commercial grower. Or if you did it, uh, do it uh, very small scale. It is unusually firm compared to the other cherries. So that's a, a benefit. There is a series that might be coming out in a couple years, mainly uh, the, the Musketeer series. It's being released in Europe first because they wanted to get plant breeders' rights. These are somewhat incre incremental increases for certain things compared to the earlier cherries. I'll show pictures of these, but Athos is a black-fruited cherry, and it was mainly selected because it has larger fruit than Carmen Jewel, but smaller than Cupid, so it will fit the cherry pitter. So, it's a little bit better quality than Carmen Jewel. We don't know enough about it. Uh, it's only been growing in our variety trial. Porthos is similar to Romeo and Juliet fruit, but the, dwar the bushes are a little bit more dwarf, so it wouldn't need as much pruning. Uh, but D'Artagnan is one I uh, like the best, but it's especially adapted to the sideways harvesters that many of our Saskatoon growers are using. Uh, similar to Romeo and Julia fruit, fruits are more dwarf, but we, we had grown them for 10 years and they still didn't need to be pruned because they were making lots of small shoots. They would, however, be a disaster if you had an upright harvester because they, they, they like to sucker a lot. So they need some less pruning. Uh, Someday the other musketeer, Aramis, well, D'Artagnan was the fourth musketeer who was the young guy. That's since the bushes are dwarf, that's why we thought we'd name it D'Artagnan. And everyone seems to remember D'Artagnan as a musketeer. But Ar Aramis is another red upright one, but it's farther away from being released. Uh, it seems to be heavier yielding than Valentine. So there's pictures of D'Artagnan. Uh, there's the bush, uh, there's Athos, a uh, very dark cherry. And this is an Athos, but it's not quite ripe yet. But I took the pictures then. And then Porthos is an intermediate color there. So that's what they look like. So now getting into Hascap breeding. Uh, this is, I can't call on any of my predecessors to have helped me with this. This is something we've done since I've gotten here. We started with germplasm from Russia, Japan, and the Kuril Islands, and those are pictures of the berries. Each, from, each berry is from a different variety or selection, right? Um, the tr there's sort of advantages and disadvantages with each type. The big disadvantage of the Russian types is they had small fruit that's about a gram large. They tend to be sour and uh, not very sweet, but they can taste good. 
and they tend to fall off the bush and ripen in, in June. The Japanese ones are bigger and can taste good, but they, um, they tend to ripen unevenly. So some berries are ripe and others aren't at the same time, which is not a good thing for mechanical harvesting. And the Krill Island ones tend to be sweet, but they're not very productive, although they are even ripening. There are three programs in North America. There's the U of S program up here. There's Maxine Thompson in Oregon, and we cooperate with her. Uh, and we have a lot of her germplasm in our breeding. And then there's Berries Unlimited, which says they're using Russian material, but they're really far south. I don't, I don't quite understand from their breeding program how they're evaluating their varieties or uh, maybe they're growing up north somewhere. Uh, the other places we got breeding material from is I had a sabbatical to gather uh, wild hascap from across Canada. And so all these little yellow dots are places where I found uh, wild hascap. But I wouldn't recommend running up to the woods and, and finding these because this is the how big the berries are. They're really small. Uh, some of the plants can be quite tall. These are on a roadside bending over, but other kinds just creep around on the ground. And there's one that's probably three and a half or four feet tall. Uh, we're using these in breeding uh, in earlier stages, but they're not really uh, suitable for growing commercially. One of the things that uh, Hascap flavor you should be aware of is they, the flavor of the varieties has changed over the years. And one of the most easily misunderstood things is that the berry up in the corner, there's a berry that looks ripe on the outside, but it's not really ripe yet. When it's ripe, a smaller berry like this should be purple all the way through. They'll look ripe usually five, seven days, depending on the weather, on the outside before they're ripe on the inside. If you get a really big fat berry, they'll only get ripe, they'll only change color halfway through. In the 1960s, the Bounet type uh, honeysuckles were bred at Beaver Lodge, Alberta, but they were more like a shelter belt type plant, and they taste like tonic water. Most people will spit them out. Uh, and that sort of gave this crop a really bad name, especially since they called it sweetberry honeysuckles. They weren't really that sweet. Uh, it wasn't until the 90s that some of the Russian varieties came through. Uh, a lot of those are sour. Some of them have some bitterness, not as bitter as the sweetberry ones, and good aroma. And usually if you cooked them and added sugar, they were tasting pretty good. Uh, in Canada, we never really got Japanese varieties yet. They might be coming from Maxine, but uh, they have uneven ripening, and the, the common flavor of that, the ones that aren't quite ripe yet, is they taste like grass. And that's not marijuana, that's more like lawn grass. But if fully ripe, they can be great tasting. Also in the 90s, uh, starting to be sold were some varieties that are called Kirill types. Uh, Blue Velvet, I think, is the only one that was widely sold. It's very ornamental, but rarely sold. They have a sweet but kind of boring flavor, and they're really low productivity. Our first varieties came out in 2008. Uh, they had a better balance of sugar and acidity and were aromatic. Our, People that visit on Hascap Days thought that they were much better than the Russian varieties. But there was another boost in flavor uh, with some later varieties after that that had half the acidity and, uh, and with higher sugar content. So the flavor of the more recent ones has uh, really surpassed our, our first varieties. Our first varieties all came from row nine and they were originally released as 
numbers, and then later they were named. Uh, Tundra was our favorite for commercial growers at the time because they had firm fruit. Borealis we considered for home gardens. I'll talk about that in more detail. And then the indigos were, uh, we knew that some Hascap propagated easier. We released those. So some growers are familiar with these as numbered selections. Uh, Borealis of the first one had the largest fruit, best flavor, but the fruit really holds on and it hides the fruit. So it's really hard to pick by hand, but also they hold on so strong they tend to tear. So this is, they make a nice home garden plant, but I don't give them any red stars for being a commercial grower. You really shouldn't grow those uh, commercially. Uh, Tundra, I would only give a rating of two, and mainly that's because I like the other one so much better. Um, it is very strong, durable fruit, but because it has smaller bushes, it's getting lower yields. So I'm urging people to get away from that. They might be something you can buy and try on a small scale to get used to it, but uh, I wouldn't be growing them usually. Indigo gem, we found, is is more productive. It's maybe 50% higher yield than the other indigos or uh, or tundra because it can sell, set some fruit with its own pollen. It has a good flavor, a high health value, uh, but it is mildew susceptible, uh, and those short bushes means actually smaller yields. The indigo, the other indigos, indigo treat and yum, they're really hard to get. They're not, they were hard to propagate and they haven't been studied much so I can't really get inspired. Uh, they were kind of, uh, uh, we released them just in case the other ones wouldn't propagate very well. Well, two years after we uh, released our varieties, some new plants were coming into production in 2010 and that center berry in that picture is actually an average tundra berry. So we just got and released our first varieties and then all of a sudden all these seedlings are showing up. They have much larger fruit and they seem to be much more productive. And then four years later uh, these were advanced, like you can see the fruit size is even increasing. I've kind of scaled them to be, we quit using a quarter as our reference and do, using a loony. Um, so the other thing I put on this slide was we're not making, the fruit size got so big, some people thought maybe we were doing GMOs or something. Plus they look so weird, right? But uh, there's not any GMOs, this is just traditional breeding methods that's increasing these berry sizes. So honeybee was our first variety released. Actually it was our first variety that was based on provincial funding. The previous breeding was was sort of we did in our spare time. And we originally released it to be a pollinator for row nine. Uh, it holds on to its fruit longer than the Russian varieties. We've since we kind of lost interest in this variety until our variety trial started growing up recently. And it's the fastest growing and highest yielding variety in our variety trial. I've got something coming up for that. It also has this, what I consider mouthfeel for wine, uh, very slight um, astringency or bitterness that you can barely perceive that tastes little like carbonated and people have tried this that have been wine experts have thought this variety might be good for wine but it does have a long narrow fruit shape and some stems stay on the berries and at first some years that seems to be a big problem some years it doesn't and the reason this is getting three stars despite uh, the high yield of this variety is because if the stems are in there, maybe that's not so good for certain products. If you're making juice or wine with it, I'd probably give this a five star. But if you're selling fresh berries, 
you might have to screen some of those stems out if you have a bad year for that. Aurora was our second variety, and this is the one that has the breakthrough with low acidity. People that tried this thought it was the sweetest Hascap they've ever had, and uh, really what it was was it has half the acidity of the varieties that came before it. It blooms in sync with tundra and indigo, very productive. I do one, when you pull it, it seems to take the same force to pull off the berry, but because it's heavier weight, I don't know if it will hold on as long. So a lot of the previous varieties would hold on for almost a month, but maybe Aurora is only going to hold on for two weeks before you harvest it. Um, I'm not quite sure because we only have a limited number of bushes right now. The next co couple of years later, we found a Boreal Blizzard, which I think was released in 2015. It's really the world's largest Hascap berries. I don't think anyone's come up with anything larger since then. The average of our first Russian varieties was one gram size of the better ones. And our newer varieties were 1.2 grams. So this, uh, this berry variety has fruit three times larger than the Russian varieties we had and twice as big as our first varieties. And yeah, so it tastes great. Uh, one of the, our competitors from uh, the south there has a variety called Happy Giant, and this is twice as big as the Giant, so I guess it could be called Giant's Giant. But it also has that low acidity. When I visited Japan, uh, I was taken to this warehouse where they were selling Hascap fruit, and this is. Uh, flats of it, they told me they, but Japan is really crazy about special fruit. So they had hired somebody to spend all night sorting through these, pulling the biggest fruits to make two flats of giant berries, of which this is the picture of the giant berries. And they told me they sold these big berries, these two flats would equal in price all these big flats. Of course, that's crazy. I don't think anyone in Canada would do that. But if you compare this picture to that one of their giant berries, Boreal Blizzard is twice as big as their expensive berries. So maybe that's worthwhile ship it flying to Japan. I don't know. I don't know where else you'd be able to sell uh, twice as big berries that much more expensive. Uh, Boreal Beauty is coming out as the world, second largest Hascap berry. It's more round. It doesn't look as big, but it's fatter, so it's and it's pretty heavy. Um, one of the things about Hascap and some of the Russian varieties, they can actually have air pockets inside, or they can be solid. So Boreal Beauty is very solid. It's also a breakthrough in being late to ripen. Uh, the last few years, it's been early August that it was ready, uh, but two years ago, uh, three years ago and last year was early August, but the year before it was late uh, July. It tastes great, holds on strong, and has like uh, very upright and mechanical harvesting characteristics, so we like that one a lot. Boreal Beast is uh, the pollinator for the other two. It overlaps, it starts blooming when Boreal Blizzard starts and stops blooming when Boreal Beauty stop, stops. Uh, it's not as big as the other two Boreals, but uh, it has one of the highest flavor and aroma ratings. It's upright bushes and it's mildew resistant, so I like that one a lot. So one of our strategies is we're trying to fill in uh, the varieties, and this is just listing our varieties. Uh, there's already a lot of Russian varieties that would be a little, a few days earlier than our late June varieties, so maybe mid June. We're, over the years to come, we want to get uh, more and more early or early July, mid July, early August varieties. So that's one of the goals of the program. One of the challenges with our varieties when you're trying to make 
we're trying to make hascap so it can be all summer long crop is that they also bloom at different times right so if you have a slowly warming year they might not overlap as well probably they will overlap a little bit but the early russian varieties probably won't uh, overlap and bloom with the late blooming types right we usually do five categories for a bloom time but if it's a average year there is most years there is overlap or if it's a fast warming year the plants seem to burst out really fast and then they overlap so some years it's important to have plants varieties in the same category but most years they can withstand being overlapped so we have charts like this on our website for our varieties uh, this is just showing our young uh, our more recent variety trial uh, the yield difference and these are very young plants that were planted in 2013 they weren't even planted at the beginning of the year I think they were planted like midsummer but uh, so three years later we're getting some production right Aurora blizzard uh, honeybee is the highest but our first varieties tundra and borealis aren't doing so well indigo gem tends to be isn't in this trial but it tends to be about 50 percent higher than tundra but the next year you can see a, a much larger increase and we're anticipating it uh, they might go up to four or five kilos for the better ones when they're fully grown these that's just the name varieties in that trial uh, but this was data taken last last season and the green bar is the size of the bush cubic uh, meters size of the bush and the purple is showing the yield per bush right so it's giving you how much yield you get uh, per bush well you're getting when the bush I think this is actually a little bit wrong on here this is kilos per cubic meter you're getting about on a lot of these a uh, kilo of fruit per cubic meter of bush size so it really is important that you're getting a fast growing big uh, bush variety this is kind of influenced how we're now screening our plants in the greenhouse we're taking our seedlings and if they're fast growing making large bushes then we're going to plant them in the field we're still making uh, hascap uh, our gains in hascap breeding we have nine fields and most of the fields are maybe two acres some are one acre and this is just we we take this is just a snapshot of different uh, berries that we like to study further it's hard to describe some of those wa wacky shapes whether it's shelled like shaped like a bell or a pear or a tube or a torpedo uh, we just take pictures of everything one of the things with hascap uh, is getting a lot of publicity is nutraceutical content and this is just showing three indicators of anthocyanins which is how dark pigment it is flavonoids and phenolics and these are different selections in the breeding program that aren't released and this is just a blueberry we grabbed from the grocery store so it's not really a good representative of blueberries but uh, one of the things you'll notice is that the worst has cap well, the best has cap for anthocyanins has more than twice as much anthocyanins than the worst. And same way with flavonoids and phenolics. Phenolics are more uniform across, but they are quite variable as to whether what the health value it is. So we had a grant that studied nutraceutical content of has cap because there might be um, reasons to breed some varieties that are high in certain nutraceuticals but there's also the idea that some hascap are better than others 
There are other HASCAP varieties coming into Canada. Uh, the I just realized I'm going really fast. Uh, <laughs> Maxine Thompson's program in Oregon, uh, she has Japanese germplasm she's using. They should be available soon. I know there's uh, some propagators in BC that are increasing numbers of hers. Hers are likely to be late season HASCAP. That'll be July, May. I don't know that they'll be August. But she's aware of the uh, uneven ripening uh, thing in, inherent in Japanese germplasm. I'm hoping she bred that out of them. But I visited her program and cooperated with her, so I would be uh, quite happy to uh, suggest trying her varieties. I think uh, she knows what she's, she's doing, so that should be tested. Uh, there's Polish varieties and berries unlimited varieties, mainly coming through uh, Nova Scotia group. Uh, but I think some propagators are beginning to get a hold of those. As far as I can, from what I've read about them, those are mainly Russian types uh, that will be early ripening, so they'd be mid-June type. Uh, fruits. I don't know if they're as small as the early uh, Polish varieties. I don't know what the flavor would be of those because I haven't tried those. We obtained a bunch of those varieties this last season and planted them. So it'll be a couple years till we actually get to evaluate those fruits. We also got uh, new Russian varieties developed in Russia. Uh, early last year. The fruit size of the Russian varieties is now twice as large as the ones we had in 2000, uh, that we were trying in around the early 2000s, right? So we planted those uh, early last year, this year, but we don't know if anyone is distributing these to Canada. We're not uh, allowed to distribute these. We can use them for, for, for uh, research and breeding, but my guess is that they're probably, these are probably better than these because uh, these were developed by the oldest and largest breeding program in Russia, uh, in Siberia, and uh, while well, these are younger breeding programs, they probably don't have the, the better stuff that the Russian material had. So now getting into uh, some other crops. I was so convinced I'd run out of time that it went so fast, so I can maybe spend a little more time on this. We are breeding grapes, uh, but it's really, even though we've been working on it for eight years, it's still very early stages. We maybe planted 10,000 seedlings in the field and our first big planting of like 6,000 seedlings, winter killed all of them except for about 10. And then uh, we started grow it, propagating them or crossing them in the greenhouse and crossing them to hybrids. They're still not hardy enough. We're finding uh, we can grow them between rows of apple trees and they'll survive, most of them will survive. So uh, we're working on that. But that's kind of a longer, more in the distant uh, program. Most of the prairie grapes right now are kind of blackish uh, varieties, uh, valiant and beta. And we've been using some, there were some wild river grapes that were green that we're using. And we're using stuff from, uh, Minnesota uh, in breeding that would have different colors. So we are working on it, but it's a bit of a side project. We're not doing much in strawberries. We have these weird, rare species that some, this one actually tastes a little bit like a Concord grape, and some of these taste a little like banana coconuts. 
Uh, they're more uh, an obscure germplasm increase thing. But one of the conditions, I put this slide up here, is that we don't, we seem to be losing our strawberry programs. Uh, they haven't replaced the breeder in uh, Ontario. And the Nova Scotia one, the Ag Canada Research Stations, and Ag Canada is now hiring not breeders, but germplasm improvers, which seems like maybe they're not going to expect it to release new varieties. But most of our varieties we had been getting from, uh, from the Nova Scotia program, uh, there's still, I believe, the program going in New York, which might be useful. Strawberries are one of those crops that you can grow other varieties uh, from other northern areas uh, if they're out east. As long as you're mulching them, they'll probably be okay. So there isn't really that much on the horizon. I know um, we were trying to get the retired, or not me, but... Uh, Rob and Dustin were trying to get the uh, breeder from Nova Scotia to do uh, to share this webinar, but he's retired, and the new person isn't necessarily going to be making new varieties. So, but there are some varieties on the market from Quebec uh, that I don't think we've really been tried at all in Western Canada, uh, and some of those got commercialized. And I would certainly look at anything that Ag Canada has already uh, produced, but I wouldn't be looking to them for new varieties in the near future. Uh, one of the things that uh, the first program installed at the University of Saskatchewan for fruit breeding was mainly apples. For decades and decades, that's been like 80% of the land for fruit breeding at the university was apples. And these are some slideshows of different selections we took uh, so we could identify our apples later on. Uh, and one of the strongest groups of apple testing has been in, outside of Edmonton, they, they link up with the uh, botanical garden there and some years have shows and stuff. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what they're called, but you can certainly, probably Rob or Dustin know their names. But they've been testing some of our varieties. We've had a few apples released in the last few years. The first one uh, was Prairie Sensation, uh, Misty Rose, Autumn Delight, and Festive Treat. They're not widely available. Like there's, there don't seem to be too many uh, nurseries doing wide scale propagation of prairie apples. Uh, we've had a system of ordering budwood directly from us in August, but you'd already have to be trained in budding to get some of the budwood. There is also another, um, there's a bunch of apples from Saskatchewan that went out as testing numbers, and I asked farmers to name them. Uh, well, they, I didn't ask, I didn't want them to name, I wanted them to stay numbers, and they asked to, can we please name these, because we can't sell 15-12-3 to anybody. So I told them all to give girl names to their apples, but then they got really fancy and started making all sorts of uh girl names that sounded really good, like Misty Rose. Well, Misty is a girl's name. Autumn can be a girl's name. Uh, there's also other ones. There's Granny Annie and some other ones. These are the four that we at the university really like a lot as compared to the other ones that farmers liked a lot, mainly because they grew it. But it would be certainly a market opportunity to somebody to take over propagating these. The treasure red apple, which was uh, being propagated by DNA Gardens, is uh, our variety. It's one of these columnar apples. The branches grow upright like this, not sideways. Ideally, they're for a home gardener, because you put if you put them on a dwarf tree, they'll fit in a backyard. 
Um, I suppose they could be grown commercially, but DNA Gardens is selling them uh, to home gardeners, and usually home gar nurse uh, commercial apple operations don't necessarily want that shape of a tree. And so I don't I don't know that I would recommend that for a commercial operation. We did have a grant to study our apples for cider quality. And this the report the full report on this is online on our your links to our website. Uh, because our apples had always been evaluated for eating quality, not juice quality. So we found some apples that were super sweet, that were so sweet they're not desirable uh, to drink as cider, but they would be very nice to blend with some more acidic fruit, like maybe sour cherries or sea buckthorn or something. Uh, so that's in there. Most of the really low acid sweet apples are prairie sensation hybrids crossed with Honeycrisp. So if you're into cider, you might uh, look up the report on that. It also ranked uh, many of the common apples uh, for that have been on the prairies too. So Crossmouth Cidery, which is south of Saskatoon, is doing large sale testing of our best cider selections. Um, large scale is like 100 trees of certain varieties they like. And I must make a plug for them because this cider operation is being run by my former graduate student and my former technician who did the apple cider juice grant. <laughs> so they've, they've, uh, gone into business with the Crossmount group to make a big cider thing and so they're the ones that helped do the research on the cider operation. Uh, one of the things that's coming up, we I wanted larger plums. A lot of our prairie plums, uh, the better tasting ones often have really thick skin which is kind of annoying or the ones that taste good, and some of them don't taste good, but they're all kind of small. I wanted some larger, tasty plums, so we were braiding a bunch of the prairie varieties to uh, BC varieties that seemed like they might have a little more hardiness. And in the generations that followed, we found that... Um, one of the best parents for breeding was developed in Alberta, Brook Gold, and when it was crossed to some red uh, plums in from BC, we got these red flesh plums, but they're still kind of small. But we're thinking we might release a few of those in the next few years. We have to figure out their pollination, whether we can put uh, two of these together. But I think they might be a nice addition uh, for something. All the prairie plums now that I'm aware of have yellow flesh. And yellow flesh plums kind of turn brown when they oxidize or haven't been picked right away. And uh, these will look nicer. Maybe they're useful for some other uh, processed products. I don't know. Um, one of the things, we've been breeding some pears. And in the 19, in 1960, there were a bunch of pears released that they call the Apostle Pears. Uh, there's Matthew, Mark. I don't think there's a Luke, but there's a John. Um, but there's they're called Apostle Pears, even though David was not an apostle. Uh, but our group of former employee and uh, the Cross Mount group decided they wanted to analyze our pears for making alcoholic perry, and they really liked David uh, from the 1960s, and that's that variety uh, for making perry. Uh, they might be useful. I don't, none of these early pears are really that great for uh, 
fruit production. I did discover one thing which uh, Rick Sawaski has worked with his pear, these pears all his career never realized. He never peeled the pears. Some of them have bitterness that comes from the, from the skin, not from the pear itself. But we also, Rick was also breeding Asian pears into these pears, using these as a parent. The Asian pears are those crunchy pears that are kind of flavor, not very flavorful. And we've got some that look like they're crunchy and uh, tasty. And some of them seem to be dwarf on their own roots. So we might actually have a dwarfing rootstock for pears. Uh, they are certainly have a longer shelf life. So that's something. But they're really small. They're, they're like a uh, little bit maybe the size of a tennis ball or a little smaller than that. So it, it might be useful. Uh, maybe some of those are good for Perry. I don't know. One of our major projects, uh, I, I, I call it my white hair project because my hair is gray now. And by the time my hair turns white, I'm hoping to have something like 10,000 fruiting bushes on campus to choose uh, varieties from. The, uh, this comes from the Les Kerr uh, donated germplasm when he was uh, when he was actually on his deathbed, in, in, he died like a week later. He was in the hospital dying. He called the breeder over to tell the breeders here uh, where his best cherries and hazelnuts were hiding at farmers' fields. And that was the beginning of our, this was, I think, 2007 or 8 or something like that. Uh, I don't know, 2009. 1980s. Um, the my predecessors went and gathered up his best hazelnuts and his best cherries from the farms that he told us to go to, and then those were crossed to regular hazelnuts. And when I got my job here, uh, we didn't have hardly any funding for anything, and what we started doing was. Uh, germinating a lot of these hazelnuts or hybrids between the, the semi-wild improved ones and good hazelnuts and selling them to farmers. And we put ads in the uh, Western Producer newspaper. And by and far, Alberta growers bought three-fourths of these. So these are located all over Alberta, we think. Uh, we sold them really cheap like a dollar or two of plant. And we were hoping some would grow up and growers would get back to us. But we're not really sure how many growers actually kept these going. The idea was that any growers that have a good hazelnut should contact us and we'll propagate them and let that grower also be in testing the new hazelnuts. Hazelnuts are pretty difficult to propagate. But this might be 10 years from now till we have a new variety, unless somebody already has a great one. But uh, they're hazelnuts. Uh, they're not related to, to the hazelnuts with the beaked ones. This is their covering. It doesn't hurt your hands to hold those. And there are some that look like they're regular size nuts. And there's something that to look forward to in the future. Just to, this is just to mention some books we've been. We were involved in uh, the earlier edition of the Saskatoon Berry Manual, which uh, Rob updated and added more photographs, and then got it printed. You can get those from Alberta Agriculture. Our Dwarf Sour Cherry Manual uh, is available at uh, U of S Bookstore. I was the editor of the Prairie Garden edition of last year's. I think you still get back orders. Those were uh, varieties of fruit uh, are all, mostly about fruit. Uh, there's a cooking with cherry cookbook from the U of S bookstore. My wife and Lil Sawaski, who's the our head technician's wife, have been uh, coming up with Hascap recipes 
because uh, they don't quite fit other fruits for the recipes, but you have to email her for that. Uh, coming out in December, uh, Sarah Williams and I wrote a book on growing fruit for northern gardens. This is mainly for, uh, it's for gardeners, but it might be a good reference if you're getting into some obscure fruits if you're a grower. I'm hoping to have a Hascap manual out next year maybe. Uh, there's about 30 Hascap articles on our website. And uh, our fruit, our website's pretty easy to remember, fruit.usas.ca. But if you go to the government of Saskatchewan, and, or if you just search Saskatchewan Ag and research reports, you get to this website and search, and you can either put the name of a fruit or my name or just fruit in there, and all these research projects will come up. There's probably been 20 research programs, things in fruit. So I guess that's the end of my talk. Uh, maybe it's going to get open now that I can answer questions. Sure, that, that was great, Bob. We've got a I've got a couple questions for you. Um, what would be the one cherry that you would recommend for southwestern Manitoba? Um, to me, it's a toss-up between uh, Romeo and Juliet. Like Romeo, I really like. It's just that minus fifty year it went bad. Okay. And out and out of those two, do you have a do you have a preference, or what would be what would be the uh, reason? I guess just simply climate, or any other well, considerations around that. It, you know, it's always nice to have more than one variety. And like we noticed, Romeo was blooming later this year, so. Uh, but Juliet has a little bit better track history. But uh, yeah, and they're both similar fruit, right? I would grow the both of them. But okay. if it's just a gardener, maybe just do Romeo. Okay. Um, who is who is it that's breeding the Musketeer series? No, we did. Okay. So it's we bred, bred it at the U of S. Yeah, we bred them. That it's like. With cherry breeding, we can work really hard to make them 10% better. With Hascap, we can work really lazy and make them 50% better. Because <laughs> mm. it, the cherries are like close to as good as we see the variation where there's so much stuff in Hascap that there's still new things coming along. Okay. And any idea of how long till those varieties are available in Canada? We don't even have propagators of those yet, but there's a lot of interest. We have to wait for them to release. Uh, I think we'll, probably the D'Artagnan one will get first. We'll emphasize that one. Okay. I'm guessing it might be three years from now. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, and if there's no more questions, then um, I just want to give a big thanks again to Bob and to let everybody know that the recording for the webinar will be available at our website, www.agriculture.alberta.ca slash horticulture later on today or tomorrow. Um, an evaluation will be sent out to you and we would appreciate it. I think I've managed to get it so that it will be coming from um, GoToWebinar. And if you could please fill that out and let us know uh, what you thought of this and what you thought of the experience, that would be great. Um, once again, thank you, Bob, for taking time out of your day and for uh, for sharing all this information with us. Uh, if you would like to, you can join us again in a couple of weeks on October 30th, when we're going to have Dr. Bridget Behe, who will be discussing some garden center applications of her eye tracking research. So once again, thanks very much, and have a great day, folks. Okay, thanks.